Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Ben Frost, and I'm the Professional Development Officer for APA's Northern New England chapter and one of the coordinators of the National Planning Webcast Series Consortium. Today is Thursday, July 30th, 2015, and we'll hear the presentation Reed versus Town of Gilbert, the Supreme Court's new rule for temporary and other signs. For technical help during today's webcast, uh, you can type your questions in the chat box uh, found on the webcast and we'll try to uh, our best to uh, help you. But if you have a truly technical question, you'll need to call GoToWebinar's tech support at the toll-free number shown on your screen. On your screen is a list of the sponsoring chapters and divisions of APA. There are over 40 of us. Uh, note that uh, the, the consortium is not formally affiliated with APA, but is kind of a, a loose-knit uh, ragtag group that manages to put together uh, these awesome webcasts uh, just about every week throughout the year and free to our members. So thank you to all of our sponsors. Today's webcast is sponsored by the County Planning Division. For more information on the County Planning Division, you can go to the website shown on your screen, www.planning.org slash divisions slash county planning. And here are some upcoming webcasts uh, for the month of August. Note that the um, all, all of these are qualified for 1.5 CM credits. The August 28th uh, webcast is also good for ethics credit. To log your CM credits uh, after the webcast, go to your dashboard on APA after logging in, select Activities by Provider, select the County Planning Division of APA, and select the title, Reed versus Town of Gilbert. You can also search by the event number 31229. This is 1.5 CM law credits approved for live viewing today. You can like us on Facebook, as many people have, and that is perhaps the best way to receive the most up-to-date information on the webcast series. We are recording today's webcast. The video will be posted on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash planningwebcast, and a PDF of today's presentation is also available on the ohioplanning.org uh, slash planningwebcast webpage, where you'll find a lot of information on the webcast series. And now I'd like to introduce the moderator for today's webcast, James Carpentier. James, take it away. Thank you so much. First, I would like to welcome everyone to our planning webcast series. And uh, second, I'd like to just give appreciation to the County Planning Division for sponsoring this session. The first part of the webcast, we'll talk briefly about the what local governments need to do to ensure that their codes comply with this U.S. Supreme Court decision, Reed versus Town of Gilbert. And as you'll learn, this case really does not answer every issue. It raises a number of questions, and hopefully we'll be able to discuss those issues also. The uh, second part of the session will uh, talk briefly about the recently completed study and research paper, Best Practices in Regulating Temporary Signs by Wendy Muller. And now I'll just introduce today's speakers. And I am the moderator, James Carpentier, and I've got the, over 25 years experience as a planner in the pu public and private sectors. And I'm currently the state and local government affairs manager with the International Sign Association. In this capacity, I work with and educate local officials and planners in the creation of reasonable, enforceable, and effective sign codes. And our first speaker today will be Professor Alan Weinstein. He holds a joint faculty appointment at Cleveland State University, Cleveland Marshall College of Law, and Maxine Goodman Levine College of Urban Affairs and also serves as director of the college's law and pol public policy program. Prior to his appointment at Cleveland State, he taught at the University of Wisconsin School of Architecture and Urban Planning, Toro College of Law, and Wayne State University. His education includes a BA from the University of Pennsylvania and a Master of City Planning from MIT and a JD 
from the University of California, Berkeley. Professor Weinstein is a nationally recognized expert on planning law who lectures frequently at planning and law conferences and has published over 75 books. Wow, 75, that's a lot. Treatise revisions and law journal articles. And Professor Weinstein has extensive practice and research experience with sign regulation. And next slide, please. The next speaker then will be Wendy Moeller. She is principal and owner of Compass Point Planning, a planning and development firm based in Cincinnati, Ohio. She has worked in the planning field since graduating from the University of Cincinnati with a Bachelor of Urban Planning. Ms. Moeller has not, not only a certified planner, but has recently received a certificate of completion in form-based codes from the Form-Based Codes Institute. And Ms. Moeller has served as a project manager and planner for numerous planning and development projects throughout her career, including primary work on, on comprehensive plans and land use regulations across the United States, focusing uh, in the Midwest. And Ms. Moeller is also a regular speaker at local, state, regional, and national conferences and is very active in the state and local section of APA Ohio where she currently serves as member of APA Ohio Board of Trustees. Ms. Moeller is also currently serving on the Board of Directors for the Signage Foundation, an organization dedicated to research and educated related to signage. And what I do too, I want to encourage you to submit questions as we go and that will allow us to uh, ask questions uh, at the end for about 30 minutes. Um, if we do not answer your question, feel free to contact any one of the speakers. So um, with that, I will turn over the presentation to Professor Whiteside. Thanks, James. Uh, ben, could we have the next slide? Thanks. Uh, so hello to everyone. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, as the case may be. Uh, I'm going to start by going over some basic First Amendment concepts, uh, just to make sure everyone is up to speed and on the same page uh, before I get to the Reed decision itself. So as, as you all probably know, the First Amendment applies to uh, regulation of any sign. And because it applies, there are certain legal effects that that has. So normally, uh, when government engages in land use regulation and a land use regulation is challenged, it's the challenger uh, who bears uh, the burden of proof and the burden of persuasion. Uh, a normal uh, land use regulation is deemed to be constitutional, and so the challenger really has to prove that it's not. What happens when government regulates signs is that government loses that normal presumption of constitutionality. So now we've got a situation where the sign regulation is presumed unconstitutional and it's government that has to bear the burden of proof and the burden of persuasion. And on top of that, sign challenges to sign regu uh, regulations uh, get the benefit of what we call heightened judicial scrutiny. Uh, if a normal land use regulation is challenged, the court is going to look at that based on a rational basis test. Uh, is, is what the government is doing rational? Is, is it trying to substantially advance a legitimate governmental interest? Uh, when a sign regulation is challenged, it's going to be subject to either a form of intermediate scrutiny or, after read, as we're going to see, strict scrutiny. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about those levels of scrutiny as we go along. Now, unfortunately, uh, litigation about signs is uh, quite common. Uh, it is very risky and it's expensive. And the reason it's expensive is even if there are not any real money damages uh, to those challenging uh, your sign code, uh, if they're successful uh, and if they brought their claim uh, under the Federal Civil Rights Act, which is the way these claims are normally brought, there is an attorney's fees uh, provision that is associated with uh, the Federal Civil Rights Act, and that allows the challenger to actually require the local government to pay its own attorney's fees. And where I am here in Northeast Ohio, uh, 
Uh, we've had a number of uh, successful challenges to local sign regulations over the past couple of decades uh, in, involving awards of uh, uh, damages and attorney's fees of five and six and seven hundred thousand dollars each. So uh, it does get expensive. Finally, even before Reed, uh, most sign ordinances contained at least some provisions that were questionable in terms of their constitutionality. And the reason for that is that, as you know, sign regulation is complex to begin with. First Amendment law is also complex. You put those two complexities together, and it is difficult to come up with a workable sign code that does not have at least some uh, provisions that are questionable in terms of their constitutionality. And we've doubled down on that after Reed. Ben, the next slide, please. So we're going to talk about a few concepts. Um, the major ones I'm going to talk about uh, are, are these three on the, uh, on the left, but I'm also going to talk about uh, uh, the two on the right. I'm not going to talk about permits and prior restraints or vagueness and, uh, and, and overbreath today. We just don't have the time. Next slide, please. So let's talk about... Uh, what about content neutrality and content based this is this is what read was really all about um, first i want to distinguish between content neutrality and viewpoint neutrality so when we're talking about content uh, neutrality what we're looking what we're talking about is uh, is your code content uh, uh, content neutral as to the subject matter viewpoint ne uh, neutrality uh, in contrast is looking at a regulation that deals with the point of view expressed by the message. So let's take a look at these examples. If you, if you just simply had a ban on all signs, well, that would be content neutral because it applied to all signs, and it would also be viewpoint neutral. So it doesn't matter what the sign says, it's banned. But if you had a ban on all political signs, that would not be content neutral. So you, you, could, you could display other signs with other kinds of messages. So it's the message of the political sign uh, that's the subject matter, so that's why it's not content neutral. But it is viewpoint neutral. You're, you're, not, you're not saying uh, signs that favor government uh, can be shown, but not signs that criticize government. And that brings us to the last one. So if you did have a ban on signs that criticize government, uh, that wouldn't be content neutral because you're identifying the subject matter and it wouldn't be new, void viewpoint neutral either. You could display a sign uh, that approved of government, but not one that criticized government. Next slide, please. So let's, let's play around with this idea a little bit. Uh, take a second and have a look at this provision. This is an actual provision from a code that was challenged. Next slide. And if we take a look at the sign uh, displayed here, um, this, this uh, it's not the actual sign, but it in fact has uh, the message that was displayed on the sign. And this was a case where uh, the, uh, this content-based code, because it's specifying uh, what the message can and cannot say, so it's dealing with the subject matter, uh, uh, that code was applied uh, to prohibit this sign. Uh, there was a challenge that was successful, and this is one of the communities that ended up shelling out over a half a million dollars. And it violated the code, arguably, because having the phone number and information about being open on Saturdays and information about being a certified five-star dealer violated the listing of numerous goods, et cetera, provision. Next slide. So take a look at this one. And let's go to the next slide, please. So um, that, that definition seems fairly benign. I would suspect many of you have codes uh, that, that contain such a, such a provision. Um, uh, that before read, uh, that, that could have well been considered to be uh, content-based in some jurisdictions. Many jurisdictions would have considered it content neutral, and we'll address that uh, a little bit later. Uh, there was, in my view at least, sort of a uh, uh, perverse effect of a provision such as this. If we take a look at the uh, top slide, the McDonald's drive-through sign, uh, 
you know, if, if the interest being served by the directional sign is traffic safety and you're dealing with a, uh, com uh, a complex commercial street environment with lots of businesses, lots of driveways and curb cuts, well, to my mind, a little logo goes a long way in terms of safe wayfinding for drivers. And uh, uh, personally, as a planner, I would not be particularly upset about allowing that logo uh, to uh, help safe wayfinding for uh, drivers, but a provision like this would have pro prohibited it. Next slide, please. Well, if you're not going to, if, if you're going to do content neutral regulation, uh, what we're really talking about in First Amendment uh, language is content neutral time, place, or manner regulations. And I think that's something you've heard about. What you're really doing is regulating uh, all of the uh, physical, structural, locational, lighting, etc. aspects of the sign. Uh, do note, however, uh, what's on that slide, the note on that sign. In, uh, slide in red about regulating color. Um, uh, regulating color in some federal circuit courts in the United of uh, appeals in the United States, in, in, in the states that uh, uh, are in that circuit, for example, the West Coast, uh, regulating color can be a problem uh, if it's applied to a federally registered trademark. Uh, so if you're uh, in Arizona, for example, and uh, you want to have uh, a common sign scheme in a shopping center and somebody has a federally registered trademark in a particular color and you're trying to have a different uh, color palette in your in your sign scheme and you and you're trying to require them to change the color on that federally registered trademark uh, that that is not going to be permissible so you got to be careful about regulating color in some parts of uh, the United States based on some case law next slide so just just to make clear what we're talking about with this content neutral time, place, or manner, you're defining signs based on their structural um, uh, or locational aspects, saying nothing about the message displayed. And then, of course, what you're regulating is the size, height, location, setback, lighting, etc. Next slide, please. Uh, another issue uh, that you need to be aware of in sign regulation is the distinction between commercial speech and non-commercial speech. Uh, and so you're seeing uh, the, the, the basic categories we're talking about here uh, on both sides of, of the sign. What you really want to pay attention to are those second bullet points under each. So commercial speech is protected under the First Amendment, but not as much as traditional or non-commercial speech. Now, if we flip over to the right side, that gets the highest degree of First Amendment protection. And the way this can be a problem for communities in sign regulation is if their sign regulations uh, either intentionally or unintentionally end up favoring commercial speech over non-commercial speech. That is a real problem. Uh, one of the ways to address it is through a substitution clause in your sign ordinance, and I'll talk about that specifically a bit later. Next slide, please. So this is pretty uh, common sense, right? You see what the commercial signs are, the, the, building, the, the business signs on buildings, the uh, billboards, and all the non-commercial signs. And of course, non-commercial signs, uh, uh, aside from the um, official signs and public service signs, do tend to be temporary signs. Next slide. Another distinction is on-site versus off-site, one that I'm sure you're, you're, you're very familiar with. Um, preview of coming attractions. The way you distinguish between on-site and off-site signs is by reading the message on the sign. That's how you figure out whether it's on-site or off-site. So keep that in mind because that's going to become an issue when we discuss some of the problems uh, that are still left with us after read. Next slide, please. And that, um, that looking at the message really works well for commercial messages. It doesn't work so well for non-commercial messages, as we'll see. Next slide. So what's this? You know, um, Honest Al for mayor, 
uh, if, if that appears on Honest Al's uh, campaign headquarters uh, or, or on his home uh, or if he has a business, uh, those arguably perhaps are uh, all on-premise signs, um, but wh where is the location of an idea? I mean, that's essentially what this is. Um, and, and so non-commercial messages really don't fit in very well to this whole idea of on-site versus off-site. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, talk a little bit about bans uh, and, and exemptions. Um, the Supreme Court's signed cases have, have gone both ways on these. So the court has upheld some total bans, a total ban on commercial billboards in the Metro Media case, uh, upheld a total ban on signs posted on public property in the Vincent case. Now that, in Vincent, that was a, a ban on all signs whatsoever. It was content neutral. Uh, the ban on commercial billboards in Metro Media, even though it had a look at the content to determine what was commercial, was viewed by the court as a content neutral regulation. Uh, but they've struck down other bans, so a ban on real estate lawn signs in the, uh, in the Linmar case and a, a ban on personal lawn signs uh, expressing ideological or political or personal messages in uh, City of Ladue versus Gilead. Uh, next slide, please. Now, let's take a look at this. Bans, uh, exemptions to a general pr uh, prohibition are always uh, problematic, and that was true even before Reed. After Reed, uh, exemptions to a general prohibition, uh, uh, as we will see, uh, are likely, very, very likely, to ha make a court say, if that provision is challenged, that this is a content-based code and subject to strict scrutiny, which means you're going to have to demonstrate that you had a compelling governmental interest for this regulation and that the regulation you've uh, enacted is uh, narrowly tailored uh, to further that interest and as part of, the, of that narrow tailoring uh, approach under strict scrutiny, you're going to have to show that the regulation was the least restrictive means you had of achieving the governmental interest which gave rise to the regulation in the first place. Next slide, please. So burden had been on government to justify the exemption. Uh, after Reed, uh, the bottom line is unless you can meet that strict scrutiny standard, your justifications just don't matter. Uh, so that is definitely one way that Reed has uh, uh, change the legal landscape for sign regulation. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's talk now specifically about Reed. So all of this uh, legal gobbledygook here is just to show you that this has uh, been going on for a while. Um, there, um, uh, Reed wanted to put up, uh, Pastor Reed uh, wanted to put up um, some uh, uh, some small directional signs. Um, he, uh, the city, uh, uh, basically said he was not complying with the regulation of such signs. Couldn't put them up. He challenged that. Um, he in in federal court he got a preliminary injunction um, uh, against the city, but uh, it went up to the uh, Ninth Circuit, and they said no, this is okay. Sent it back down uh, to the uh, federal district court. Uh, the federal district court upheld the city. That went back up to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which affirmed. Ultimately, this, course, this case got to the Supreme Court and was reversed uh, uh, by the Supreme Court just this past June. Next slide, please. So what were the provisions at issue? Um, the, we had these three different uh, provisions. Uh, which were really exemptions from a permitting requirement for signs. So the signs that Pastor Reed wanted to put up were these temporary directional signs uh, relating to a qualifying event by a nonprofit. Uh, they weren't actually six by six signs. What that means is that you could have a sign that could be up to six square feet, could be up to six feet high. Uh, it was allowed for 12 hours before the event and an hour after. And you could have no more than four signs on any property and, of course, how to obtain 
the consent of the owner. Now let's contrast that with political signs. For political signs, you could have an unlimited number of signs, and they could be up to 32 square feet. The 30, 32 square feet was in non-residential areas, they would be 20 square feet in residential areas. Uh, they could be displayed uh, without a time limit before an election, but did have to be removed 10 days after. And then uh, the ideological signs provision allowed an unlimited uh, number of signs, they could be up for an unlimited amount of time, and uh, they could be up to 20 square feet. So you can see why uh, Pastor Reed felt, gee, I'm not getting a fair shake here. Next slide. So to give you an idea of what we're really talking about in terms of differences in size, uh, the green is the, is the size of the sign Pastor Reed could put up. You see the political signs, the ideological signs, and also just to give an idea of scale of other sign regulations, a homeowners association sign announcing a subdivision uh, could be in the, uh, uh, as big as the darker uh, blue. Next slide. So here's what Pastor Reed was putting up, these, these rather small temporary good news signs, and he was being cited for those. Next, please. So when this got to court, what, what the church was arguing was, well, look, these rules disfavor our temporary directional signs when they're compared to the political and ideological signs. And the city's defense was, hey, uh, each of these classifications of signs and its restrictions, they're based on objective factors relevant to the town's creation of the specific exemption from the permit requirement and they don't otherwise consider the substance of the sign. Uh, in other words, they were arguing, we really didn't care what the sign said. Uh, we were dealing with sort of the purpose and function of the sign and how that related uh, to our governmental interests in aesthetics and traffic safety. And of course, that was the, uh, 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 that was the approach that was used in a number of circuit courts. Next slide. So we come to here, so we have this, you know, we, we have this focused issue in the litigation, uh, Pastor Reed signs, but there was this larger issue involving the fact that there was a split among the Federal Circuit Courts of Appeal on the issue of what is content neutrality in a sign code. Uh, now, as we've said, this, this case comes out of the Ninth uh, Circuit, uh, the West Coast, uh, Arizona, etc., and those circuits, and this was the majority of circuits that had ruled on this issue, they said, well, the question really is about content neutrality is, is the government trying to regulate or censor content? If it's not, then it's, it, we're going to treat it as content neutral, which means it's subjected only to intermediate scrutiny. Government has to show that they have a significant or substantial governmental interest, and they've adopted, uh, their regu and the regulation they've adopt, adopted is narrowly tailored. Uh, to advance that interest. So that's intermediate scrutiny. And the reason we're going to treat it as content neutral is, hey, look, uh, as we've already said, First Amendment law is very complex, so local government needs a little leeway in navigating through that complexity. And so a limited number of content-based provisions that are not intended to censor or restrict speech, you know, that are just trying to uh, functionally uh, uh, achieve the purposes in the sign code, that's acceptable, and we're not going to subject that to strict scrutiny. But in the 5th and 8th and 11th circuits, they took this need to read or, or absolutist approach. Hey, if you have to look at the message on that sign to determine if the rule applies, that is a content-based code, and that is subject to strict scrutiny, which means you need to show a compelling governmental interest for the regulation, and that regulation at the end of the day has to be the least restrictive means of achieving that uh, uh, interest. And so all of these signs uh, below, in, in, um, uh, and I suspect all of, all, almost all of your sign codes have these uh, types of signs defined, that's all content-based after read. Next slide. So what how did the judges actually rule here? So the court was unanimous 
in ruling that the challenge code provision, that provision that limited pastoree to those small signs and, and the limited number and time and allowed these other signs to proliferate was unconstitutional. But they really uh, split on the question of why is it unconstitutional. So um, there was a majority opinion uh, written by Justice Thomas that was joined by Chief Justice Roberts and Justices Scalia, Kennedy, Alito, and Sotomayor. And then there was a concurrence by Justice Alito along with Justices Kennedy and Sotomayor. Uh, Justice Breyer writing for himself and Justice Kagan in a, an opinion joined by Justice Breyer and Justice Ginsburg, uh, <clears throat> they filed opinions concurring only in the judgment. So what that means is they, their opinion said, okay, we agree that this code is unconstitutional, but we don't agree with the analysis used by, the, uh, by Justice Thomas in his majority opinion uh, telling us why it's unconstitutional and what the rules should be. So even though uh, these, t these two opinions concurring only in the judgment uh, are, are legally concurrences, they're effectively dissents because they are effectively dissenting uh, with, uh, with, with the analysis and rule stated by Justice Thomas. Next slide. Well, what Thomas said was, <clears throat> from now on, we're going to have an on-its-face rule. If you have to read the message displayed on a sign to determine how that sign is regulated, then that regulation is content-based. Uh, this quote below, um, he, he's saying here that, that some of these facial distinctions are obvious uh, because we're defining regulated speech by particular subject matter, but others are more subtle, defining regulated speech by its function or purpose but in his view, both are based on the message the speaker conveys and therefore are subject to strict scrutiny. In other words, what he's saying here, although he doesn't come out explicitly in his opinion and address the circuit split, he is clearly uh, saying the, the on its face, you have to read it, absolutist approach is correct, and the uh, no censorship or purposive or functional approach is wrong. Next slide. He also says, in his opinion, that a facially content-neutral regulation, so it, you read it and doesn't seem to be content-based, will be considered content-based if it's a regulation that can't be justified without reference to the content or the regulation was adopted because of disagreement with the message conveyed. Well, what he's doing here is, is actually sort of flipping around um, a, uh, a First Amendment test that was, that, that was announced in, in a couple of prior uh, rulings uh, that did not involve signs. And we're going to have to wait and see how the lower federal courts apply this idea of can't be justified without reference uh, to the content. We really are not quite sure yet what that means. Next slide. <clears throat> so we've been through this, right? If a sign regulation is content-based, it's subject to strict, strict scrutiny. And uh, just to remind you, on this uh, bottom point, narrowly tailored, that includes in the strict scrutiny um, situation uh, that it has to be the least restrictive means of regulation. Next slide. So after Reed, Categorical signs are content-based. He, uh, Justice Thomas, explicitly says that. So all of these categories, as we've said before, that are probably in your codes, those are now all content-based. Those are now all subject to strict scrutiny. Next slide. Uh, he also said that speaker-based or event-based signs are content-based. And um, so arguably, uh, the, the first couple of these are uh, event-based signs. Uh, uh, a lot with a property for sale or, or rent, that's an event. Uh, a lot where construction is taking place, that's an event. Um, is a gasoline station sign a speaker-based sign? Or is it a land-use category sign? Same for theater signs. Uh, 
Uh, so another another point we're not sure about, how are lower federal courts going to look at that? Cities are going to say, hey, that's just a land use classification. Uh, those who are challenging it uh, are going to say, no, uh, you're allowing the speaker, gasoline station owners, to speak more than others, and ditto for theaters. We're going to have to see what happens with that. Next slide, please. Um, so hammering this point again, uh, his opinion, Thomas's opinion, means that the fact that uh, your purpose or justification for regulation had nothing to do with trying to limit speech doesn't matter, and strict scrutiny usually means that government's going to lose. Next slide. Well, Thomas then said, well, hey, there's still lots that government can do, despite uh, my rule. Uh, they can regulate all the aspects of science that have nothing to do with a sign message. So all of the content neutral time, place, or manner regulation is still all right, as long as, right, uh, what he said before, it's not facially content neutral, but we're really justifying it uh, because of the content. Uh, we can prohibit signs on public property as long as regulation is content neutral. Well, that's been true since the Vincent case 30 years ago. Uh, he says an interesting thing here next. Certain signs may be essential, example, for safety purposes and well might survive strict scrutiny. Well, that sounds great. The problem is that, is that there have been a number of opinions, uh, even at the Federal Circuit Court of appeals level that has said that traffic safety is not a compelling governmental interest. So now we've got some conflict between what Thomas has said and prior rulings in, um, uh, in the intermediate federal courts. Uh, next slide, please. Alito's concurring opinion said, well, hey, you still can regulate science, and here are some rules that would not be content-based, and he gives a laundry list. You're seeing some of them here. Well, let, let me point to a couple of them, though, that are a little problematic. Um, so take a look at on-site versus off-site. We've already talked about that. Uh, he, the court previously had said you can make that distinction, and it's not content-based, uh, and that's what Alito is saying. But Thomas's opinion says, hey, if it's content based on its face, it's subject to strict scrutiny. So which is it? We don't know. Uh, and look at the next one uh, below that. Rules imposing time restrictions on signs advertising a one-time event. Well, uh, a sign advertising a one-time event is an event-based sign, and that is subject to strict scrutiny. I mean, so I guess one way of interpreting that is, well, if, if you uh, um, if you had a if, if you had a, an event sign that could survive strict scrutiny, you could impose time restrictions. But even then, it's not so clear because why are you imposing the time restrictions and are you imposing different time restrictions on different event-based signs? You, you can see where the logic of of uh, uh, Thomas's uh, absolute rule can take you uh, places you don't want to go. Next slide. Uh, Breyer and Kagan's concurring opinions uh, basically said the same thing. Uh, you didn't have to go that far. This is a mess. Uh, it's going to cause all kinds of problems. Why did you do that? Uh, Justice Kagan, in particular, uh, said, you know, the challenge code provision couldn't have uh, survived intermediate scrutiny. And in fact, in her view, uh, it couldn't even have survived what she called the laugh test. Uh, can you can you can you read this and and not laugh at it? Uh, so she said there was no reason to 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 go as far as as the court has, but uh, they were in the minority. Next slide, please. So what don't we know? Well, I've already talked about billboards because we've got this conflict between what Alito says, the prior Supreme Court rulings and Thomas's on its face rule. Uh, the decision really didn't talk about the commercial, non-commercial distinction, uh, but that's another one that is on its face content-based. You, ha you have to read the message on the sign to, to figure out if it's commercial or non-commercial. Compelling interest, we just talked about that briefly. Uh, we've got these lower court opinions that say traffic safety is not a compelling governmental interest, and then we have Justice Thomas, in his majority opinion, sort of suggesting that it is, and it's not clear how court, the lower courts 
will apply this narrowly tailored least restrictive means portion of uh, strict scrutiny if, if it means uh, uh, declaring unconstitutional much needed traffic safety signage distinctions. Uh, I don't know if a federal court, federal court judge isn't going to try to find a, w a way to uphold uh, those kinds of, uh, of, of decisions. Next slide, please. So some do's and don'ts uh, after read. Uh, definitely you have to review your code to identify the content-based regulations, for example, all of those categorical regs. And let's go over to the don't slide. Once you identify them, don't enforce them. Uh, enforcing those content-based regulations after read is like waving a please sue me sign. And the truth of the matter is that there are uh, attorneys out there uh, who, uh, you know, are ready, willing, and able uh, uh, to uh, take on these cases because uh, if, if you're doing that, they're going to win and they can get their attorney's fee, they can get you to pay their attorney's fees, so uh, you're, you're going to get sued, don't do it. Uh, you need to add, if you don't have them already, you need to add severability clause and a substitution clause. Uh, and you need a strong purpose clause that's linked to the regulations. I'll show you something about that uh, in a second. Uh, the, the second point under don't, uh, don't enact a moratorium on all sign permits. That is going to be uh, another please sue me sign. Uh, that is a prior restraint on uh, expression. Uh, you're going to get sued, you're going to lose. Um, if you it's better, in my view, to simply not enforce the content-based regulations rather than put a moratorium on sign permits. If, you, if, if, if for whatever reason you feel you need to have a moratorium, that moratorium should only be on sign permits in these categorical, uh, for these categorical, categorical arguably content-based signs, and the duration of that moratorium needs to be as short as possible. Uh, I, I, uh, I think um, uh, the shorter the better, and I would be getting real nervous uh, for, uh, for any moratorium that lasts more than, th than 30 days. I think you're just asking for trouble. Next slide, please. Okay, what's a severability clause? Uh, it's uh, if any part, uh, well, you can read it. Read it. What it's saying basically is, hey, if you're displaying a commercial uh, message, uh, you can display a non-commercial message uh, in this at the same location, size, etc. You don't need a permit. It's great. It's it's a way of making sure that you're not favoring commercial over non-commercial speech. Next slide, please. Uh, regulatory uh, uh, regulatory purposes. These, these, are, these are lengthy, and a actually, let's go back. I think I was talking, can we go back a slide, please? Okay, uh, one more, go back one more. Okay, so let's go forward, sorry. So I had the severability clause first. Uh, I, I'm, I was getting, I'm getting confused in, in, in terms of the, the presentation. Uh, so the severability clause is basically saying if we've, if we've blown it on any provision in the sign code, uh, hey court, we've already decided you can sever that and the rest of the code will stay in place. A court may or may not uh, follow this, but uh, you're much better off having this. Okay, now let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, this, the regulatory purposes, let's get the next one for regulatory purposes. You know, too dense for you to read as we're going along, but the point to, to get, to take away from that is the image that these are, f uh, are fairly lengthy, fairly detailed regulatory purposes. Uh, and and those are still going to help uh, uphold your your code if challenged. Next slide. Uh, well, I don't know what happened. I thought I had a slide for a substitution clause. I don't know what happened, but I've told you what that is, right? It just basically says you can you can substitute a, a, the non-commercial message for a commercial message wherever it appears. So what should be in your code? Your purposes, definitions. You need to be explicit about the standards for measuring regulations for your content neutral time, place, or manner, provisions for enforcement, 
uh, regulations for problematic signs, billboards, temporary portable, etc. Prohibited signs, those are really something you have to think hard and fast about because uh, um, um, those are likely to be seen as um, uh, content-based regulations after read, uh, non-conforming signs and uh, administration. And I think that concludes my presentation and I'll turn it over to Wendy. All right, thank you. I had to unmute myself there for a second. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, the kind of practical implications of this in our sign regulations, um, for the most part based on the research I did to develop um, a temporary uh, guide for temporary sign regulations. Um, and I am going to try and point out some kind of cross discussions that uh, Alan started to bring up, and I, I welcome Alan to jump in any moment if he can expand on any particular uh, issue or that, but I will try to raise a point, particularly where there's still some some gray areas or fuzzy areas that you're going to be uh, want to be very well aware of. Uh, next slide. So uh, with the most communities, uh, they really find it the easiest to regulate permanent signs. I mean, it's a structure. It's like a fence. It's a shed. You can you can you know uh, focus on it and and. Again, here the biggest issue is typically whether it's an on-premise sign or off-premise, uh, with the off-premise being billboards. On-premise, uh, you know, most of the, the communities understand that the businesses want that for commercial signage, but if they want to put up some kind of free speech opinion on the permanent su uh, structure, they're not usually going to get too caught up in that. So that's where that substitution clause comes in. Um, so, you know, temporary or permanent signs, while there are issues, they tend to be the ones that are easier to control. Uh, next slide. Keep going, I had a double slide there. Um, now, I, I don't think Alan brought this up, but we had talked about it in a previous discussion. Um, free speech challenges related to permanent signs are less common, but they are still out there. And I always like to bring up this um, particular case, uh, which I actually wasn't involved in, but I, I worked with the community afterwards, and it's in Tip City, Ohio. Uh, and here, and we, I know this is becoming uh, more of an issue with communities where the wall murals and people saying, is it art or is it a commercial sign? Um, and in this case, what you see um, is, was actually determined to be a commercial sign that faces Interstate 75. And in the city, they weren't allowing signage on the, the rear side of this building, and so they painted this, this beautiful sign, I guess. And um, the city said, no, you've, you've overstepped the amount of wall signage you're allowed. Uh, and they ended up going to court. And the uh, business owner claimed that this was just freedom of expression, you know, it's just wonderful art. And the city said, no, you know, you make specialized fuels and you actually have the, com the, the chemical um, symbol for the fuels you're making on the sign. Now, that's not on this picture. And the, the courts actually ruled that it was a commercial signage in this case. Um, they actually ended up losing the case on some other matters. But I think this is a situation where they did raise the issue about murals and, and wall signs being a free speech uh, issue. And it becomes kind of difficult when there's not what we sometimes see as a pure sign where there's somebody's name or a business name. Next slide. Um, um, and while I'll, I'll also point out um, that while there are still uh, a lot of questions that have to be answered after the Reed case, um, our biggest issues do tend to be wrapped up in the temporary signs. And while Reed did answer maybe one question, I think it does leave a number of other ones open. Um, but the reason why temporary signs also tend to be a problem, not just about the content neutrality issue, is um, particularly for planners, and I'm assuming most of the people listening in today are, are um, in the administration component of planning. Uh, administration enforcement tends to be a big and complicated deal for us, and it's, it's kind of the bane of the existence. Um, the technology, just like any signage, is constantly evolving. There's always this question about what's reasonable and the number and size, let alone the content, uh, how long it can be, and, and that type of issue. Next slide. <clears throat> 
so that's kind of what led uh, led me into this research into um, temporary signs, and I, I was able to work with uh, a couple of groups on it. And as part of it, I spent a year uh, researching this, which you can all imagine was wonderful, as I spent a lot of time reviewing ordinances and looking up how communities regulate temporary signs and talking to colleagues. Um, we also did a survey where over 99 communities participated from across 31 states telling us how they did things, where they were running into problems, um, and where they needed guidance in. Uh, and this was all reviewed by attorneys and um, planning planners and planning uh, uh, professors, I'm sorry, as well as temporary sign uh, representatives. Next slide. So what I thought I would do, or what I was asked to do as part of this presentation uh, and focus my efforts on, are what are some of the best practices related to regulating temporary signs focusing more on the stuff that's going to be a little bit closer to the read situation or, you know, related to read as much as I can. Now, in some cases, uh, I may be speaking a little bit more just from the sense that I know certain things are a lot more of problematic for communities. Um, but one of the best practices is to make sure that you're making a distinction between a temporary sign and a temporary message. Because the temporary sign is actually a sign that is intended to, uh, or is, is temporary or portable, so it's not really intended to be some kind of permanent installation. Now, yes, they may tie it down or somehow anchor it, but it's still not intended to be permanent. Next slide. Whereas the temporary message is where the sign itself, the sign structure itself is permanently installed somehow, but the message can either manually or electronically be changed. And these are the ones we're uh, most familiar with, and I know that electronic message centers are still um, kind of being figured out by a lot of communities. Um, here, it's still fairly easy, if you want to, to be content uh, neutral, um, because communities are just saying, you know, here's how often the message can change, um, or how it can be illuminated and the like, but it's not focusing on what the content is. And in many cases, especially on electronic message centers, um, many uh, applicants will often say, hey, we'll use some of our messages to advertise for public events or um, essentially non-commercial speech. And, and so I, I think this is an easier one where you, don't, you can just say, regardless of the content, here is um, how often you can change that message. Next slide. So here's, this slide's going to be one where if you've been taking notes through this, this is where things get kind of fuzzy and where Reed's really going to throw us for a little bit of a loop. Um, in my research over the last year or so, um, what I found is that everybody seemed to focus on the permanent sign regulations. And, and while they would have temporary sign regulations, a lot of times they just grouped it all as one. So, you know, temporary signs, regardless of what type they are, are allowed for, for example, 30 days out of the year. Um, and they didn't try to take into uh, account any type of situations. And the situations where people did regulate them were, hey, real estate signs, which, yep, that the question becomes, that is that content-based? Because if you look at it and you're saying it says for sale or lease, you know, th that's a content-based type regulation. Um, and again, going back to the whole original read challenge, the, the definition or the type of sign that applied there was a temporary directional sign relating to a qualifying event. And so that relationship where the, I'm assuming the requirement was that the language and the content of the sign had to relate to the event is probably where um, the biggest hitch came into this case. Um, the reason why I recommend you at least consider this, at least cautionarily, as part of any sign regulations is because um, particularly things like sidewalk signs, and there you can easily tie regulations to the structure, the sidewalk time, what, uh, sign, what type of sign it is. Um, but here, sidewalk signs tend to be things that are allowed year-round. You know, maybe they have to be put in and put out during business hours. Um, but you're not even getting into the content of that language. Um, and as Alan had pointed out earlier, one of the questions that's not been addressed yet is whether or not you can get into the on-premise, off-premise signage uh, content and whether that will eventually become an issue. Um, but I think sidewalk signs is a good example where that's not necessarily something um, 
that falls into the same thing as you might see a sign for some type of special event. So um, with some great caution, um, I put out there that you, you may want to consider um, your situation. And Alan, I'm going to have you jump in here because one of the yeah. issues we yeah. brought up was I think the difficult one that many communities are going to be dealing with are real estate signs. And I say that as the example and not as how to regulate them. Um, but when we were moving towards more content neutral regulations, we saw a lot of communities regulate yard signs based on properties that are for sale or lease. And some people infer that to mean that still the content has to say for sale or for lease where typically when I am working with communities about being content neutral, I'm saying you really can't control what that commercial message says. So, you know, if they wanted to use that for something else, you might run into issue. And I think that's where Alan was talking about, you know, this is something I think that still will be resolved. Yeah, Wendy, I think it's really, uh, uh, we, we just don't know what the answer is. Uh, if, if I wanted to challenge a provision like you have with your asterisk, uh, you know, I, I could either claim, well, look, that's an event sign, and furthermore, uh, the only real uh, <clears throat> justification uh, to have that provision uh, is, is, is to, uh, uh, because you want to allow real estate signs, whether for sale or for lease, and we just don't know how a court is going to read uh, I should say, let me say interpret the read decision. Uh, read, read the decision is a term of art, but it doesn't work well with reading read. Uh, we don't know how the, inter the courts are going to interpret that. So uh, I, I think before read, that was great. After read, it, it, we, don't, we just don't know. And I think one of the examples that I also brought up, not just about real estate signs, is in read, they talked about it being event-based. And if you're, the, the example I can show on this slide with the spirit of Halloween sign, which is obviously tied to Halloween, um, you know, I think the biggest problem you would run into is if you were saying the sign has to be, it has to be related to that event, so that temporary sales. Um, I, I think where there's some question if there's some leeway for the communities is if you said, okay, you're getting a permit for a temporary use. And as part of that temporary use, you're allowed to have one banner sign, but you don't get into what that banner sign is other than it's got commercial speech, whether or not that's event-based. And I would probably make the argument, as long as you're not requiring it to um, have content related to the actual event, that you might be okay. But I think there's still some question to that. So I think the, the takeaway point for this slide we and Wendy, let me Wendy, let me let me just interrupt for a second, and 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 this is where the substitution clause comes in, uh, you know, because uh, without the substitution clause, uh, someone can can say, hey, wait a second, uh, he's allowed to put up spirit of Halloween. Uh, I I I want to put up a sign that that says, you know, President Obama is great or President Obama is horrible. Uh, and so he gets a commercial sign, but I don't get my non-commercial sign. And the substitution clause uh, helps you there because it basically says, hey, if you could have put up a commercial one, you, you, can, you can switch it to non-commercial, and that's okay. Yeah. So I think the, the takeaway, though, is that this is where there's still a need to be cautious and to very carefully look over how you do regulate signs. And I think there is going to be a transitional uh, time here as we kind of flesh out what this all means. Uh, and we can all kind of figure it out as we go along. But I think we'll be watching for some additional um, cases that are likely to result out of all this. So now let's talk about something a little bit easier, if we can go to the next slide. Um, the, when we did the survey, one of the, the number one problem that communities or planners identified with temporary signs was actually the administration enforcement. You know, a lot of them felt very comfortable with, with the, their regulations, um, even though they had some questions about content-based based regulations. And I will, as a side note, point out it was interesting to read some comments from planners who said, you know what, um, the way we've written our language, we've tried to be as content neutral as possible, but I recognize that we are our officials or somebody had directed us to do something that was more content regulation. So I think there's a lot of, of planners out there who understand content neutrality but are um, having to educate 
their elected officials on what that means and sometimes they're not necessarily, um, they're willing to take that risk to have a little bit of content based and that's kind of a caution out there as well. So anyways, the administration enforcement doesn't really play as much as an issue in the Reed case, but I brought it up because it has been such an issue with planners. And so I wanted to kind of comment on some of the things we've seen out there. And I think the number one thing that I've seen out there is this, is this movement to use more technology, not just for all our zoning issues, but specifically for temporary signs. And one of the things I found in my research was uh, several communities are doing online permitting, in which case um, they actually, nobody has to even come in to get a permit at the counter. They can go on and apply and these, these um, programs are actually monitoring it. So if you come in and you, you're only allowed to have uh, signs twice a year and you ask for a third one, it's going to say no, you don't get a permit. Um, for smaller communities, I was seeing use of things like just basic calendar apps, which you know sends up a red flag when uh, enforcement uh, needs to go out and check certain signage. Um, other areas are putting more of a burden on the applicants to uh, help with enforcement and, and we've seen this a little bit where some communities are requiring uh, stickers or tags on their larger temporary signs so that anybody who's authorized to do enforcement can go out and very quickly see when the, um, by looking at the sign, if it's expired and if it's expired they can pull it. So that's just to kind of give anybody who's thinking about those particular issues some thoughts to go by. Um, next slide. So, um, and don't, let's stay on the slide for a second because I do have another fun and interesting story and Alan may know this story as well. Um, but the kind of last 15 minutes of, of my time, I wanted to talk about some prevalent sign types and the best practices and regulation, uh, regulating those particular types of signs or like I mentioned, some of the red flags. Um, so I'm going to talk about different ones. I'm not going to be able to bring up every type of temporary sign structure out there because we just don't have the time. I could spend a whole session on that alone. Um, so I'll talk about those. But one of the interesting anecdotes about this whole content question uh, actually stems from the picture of the turkey there, the inflatable turkey. And Alan, this is a Northern Ohio case. Um, this was a car dealer who had a series of, I don't even remember the number, it was something like 24 or 30 different inflatables, very large inflatables, um, that uh, he would change out with the different seasons and everything like that. And the, the community said, hey, listen, you're doing that as commercial advertisement for your, um, your car dealer, even though for the most part they didn't have signs. Now, interesting, when I took this picture, it did have an election sign on it. but. Um, so the, the car dealer went to court and argued, no, this is, this is a seasonal display, you know, I'm, I, am, um, I am regulating or I'm just putting up, you know, signs to celebrate Christmas and Thanksgiving and the like and, and the, the community still argued, no, it's, it's bringing attention to um, your car dealer and in fact the, the cases wherever it ended up and I can't recall where this case particularly ended up, um, but the courts finally said, no, this is a commercial sign because you are are pointing out um, you're raising attraction toward your car dealer. So in this case, they were able to argue that this was actually a commercial sign rather than free freedom of expression. Um, and also before I move on, I see that James actually asked me if I could explain the substitution clause and I'm actually going to ask if Alan will jump in because I think he's better situated to further explain that substitution clause. Uh, yeah, I mean, simply uh, what the substitution clause is going to do is 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 it's going to state that um, uh, it, whenever a sign is permitted to display a commercial message, uh, a non-commercial message may be substituted for the commercial message. Uh, in other words, whoever is um, is permitted to display the sign. Uh, so let's take a look at where we're on this slide. We've, we've got this Verizon sign here at the top, right? Uh, Verizon's not going to do this, but um, if, if Verizon uh, wanted to um, uh, put a sign there, or maybe the tech is better because that, you know, you can more easily, you know, just do a, a quickie sign in that uh, space. Um, uh, and it would say something, you know, like vote, uh, vote against whatever. Uh, they'd be allowed to do it, and and the and the purpose is not to inadvertently uh, favor commercial over non-commercial speech, which can be a problem. So the the better example, of course, is what we were talking about previously uh, with the Halloween sign, uh, where you're allowing temporary signage that has commercial speech, 
uh, but not for non-commercial speech. So with a substitution clause, uh, you would you would avoid that problem. Uh, you would just say, hey, look, if you can, yes, you could put up a, a commercial banner for 24 days, uh, but uh, if you want to put up a non-commercial one, that's fine too. And uh, it, it just is a way of inoculating yourself. Um, and then just one other point, if I may, uh, Wendy, with, uh, with our friend the turkey here. Um, uh, it's not bad in a code to have a provision about uh, um, uh, att uh, attention-getting devices. And, and sort of have a laundry list about inflatables and other things that can be attention-getting devices, uh, and don't spe and and don't uh, re really you know you're just describing them uh, structurally and functionally, and and then regulate them. And that's and that's a really good way to avoid uh, this kind of thing. So you know if 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 you put a uh, huge inflatable turkey on top on top of a car dealership, that becomes an attention-getting device, and you can uh, regulate or prohibit it. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, so one of the first, I guess, types of uh, sign types that uh, we see out there and, and everybody loves is those uh, attention-getting devices <laughs> known as air graphics or balloons or air-activated graphics in this case. Um, some communities love them, some communities hate them, and they, they, they prohibit them, and that gets back into that can you prohibit certain types of signs. and um, I think we've fleshed that particular issue out enough. But best practices with regards to these, I think, is one, you need to be really clear whether or not um, air-activated graphics are allowed. So whether or not it's got, if there's anything that is allowed to be in motion or if it has to be kind of a static balloon device. Uh, and, and we've got examples of both. Um, and that just, and if usually the ones that have some kind of motion have to have further setbacks and have to be in areas where they're obviously not going to damage cars or damage landscaping and the like. Um, these tend to require some level of permit, whether it be a temporary sign permit or some kind of temporary permit. Um, these signs are also typically allowed for much shorter periods than your typical uh, temporary banner sign or yard sign, and uh, the, probably the average uh, that we see out there is that they're allowed for four, 14 consecutive days during any single year. And um, also adding, again, any safety type requirements which are very clearly allowed by zoning um, to ensure that these don't um, float off or move, particularly given any type of um, harsh weather. Next. Um, the banner sign is probably one of two of the common um, temporary signs we see out and about. And I think that um, this tends to be the sign that most communities are more accepting of, uh, in large part because they're, they're typically attached to structures um, or their um, you know, tax defenses and the like, and they're not as prominently placed out in the yards, although they do sometimes end up being tied to posts and installed in um, front yards or long streets. And in those cases, we see those tend to be regulated by yards as yard signs rather than as the banner sign that they may be designed as. Um, when it comes to these, uh, depending on the size, is whether or not a community will, or will require a permit. But I think here is where you run into issues with timing, um, because as with the spirit of Halloween uh, example, and those types of uses, seasonal uses, can often be around for 60 or 90 days which is a lot longer than most people want to allow temporary signs. And so um, there we'll see communities say, you know, if you're getting a, a permit for a temporary use, you're allowed to have one type of sign with that, you know, and issue it in, in addition to that. And it simply state that it's a commercial sign. Uh, in other cases, we're also seeing it used as interim sign options. So the, the previous sign next to Verizon where uh, a new use is moving in and somebody wants to, um, put up, you know, get started immediately, but they don't have their permanent sign in place, that they can place a banner for a period until their, their permanent sign is, is involved. Generally, when we see it across the board, though, um, we do see that this is used from between 14 and 30 days a couple times a year. Um, I'm getting a little bit of a warning that um, I need to wrap things up here um, because we've been talking and having some good discussion. So I'm going to skip a, a couple of these. Let's skip to the one more here and then the next one. And I'm just going to bring these up as some, oh, go back. 
you're, you're hitting both of them that I want to talk about. Um, the freestanding yard signs and actually any temporary signs, I think this is a good example of where there's still going to be some gray area. These are very common. Um, I don't have my pretty picture of all the election signs, but I'm sure everybody can um, see what those are. Um, the easiest things about these is where you regulate them. Usually the size is related to the context of the um, neighborhood. So obviously freestanding signs in a downtown character usually are going to be smaller. Freestanding signs along an interstate are going to be much larger for the visibility aspect, not just because um, the, the property owners want it, but just to have the, the, the text and the content visible. Um, here is where obviously this is a good example, uh, lovingly from my my own township, um, where free speech has come into play. And you know this in Ohio in particular, we try to stay as hands off on any type of free speech sign. So you know this was allowed to stand, and it wasn't tied to an election. So you have to get away from that. Um, can you uh, you know when do you put this up? There is no event that this is tied to. So this is again something where you have to be careful. Um, I also wanted to tie back to a point that Alan had mentioned about prohibitions um, and mentioned that there have been communities that have at least have tried to prohibit all yard signs or prohibit particularly all real estate signs. And in those cases, um, my understanding is they were struck down. And so this is where you have to be really careful about trying to strike down a particular type of sign. Next one. The people signs are another one of these that's going to, that it's actually already working its way up in the courts um, on a number of issues. And it's one that you, and I highly caution that you work very closely with your legal counsel because I think there are different issues in different states about how these play out. Um, court case, like I said, the court cases are working through. We've had recently one in Ohio where, um, you know, they made the argument that with the Liberty tax that they were just out there dressed like Lady Liberty and therefore weren't a sign. It was an expression. And, in, and unfortunately for the business owner there, he did claim that it was a sign or did not battle that it was a sign. Um, but there's a lot of ways people are trying to circumvent sign regulations with people signs by claiming that it is freedom of expression. Um, and so this is where one of, this is just going to continue to be an issue, and I think this is where Reed doesn't provide that much clarity on some issues. Uh, and in fact, I think in one community somebody said that they were getting around it by having a smaller sign on the bottom of these commercial signs that said this is a protest to try to claim that the entire sign was in fact free speech. So uh, clever, clever ways of trying to get around this, and I think some of this will play out in, in the next few months. Uh, moving on, sidewalk signs I talked a little bit about before. Here's where you need to be careful about right, uh, complete uh, prohibitions on your signage in the right-of-way. I tend to always encourage prohibitions in the right-of-way across the board, but uh, sidewalk signs tend to be in the right-of-way by their nature. Uh, and so, you know, this is where you need to be a little cautious about where, what you're saying for all your sign types if you do want to, in fact, allow um, sidewalk signs. Moving on. And then the finally, uh, one last sign that I'll talk about is the vehicle signs and wraps, which are, again are becoming uh, more and more common, especially as the costs go down. Um, here, I highly encourage you to avoid any requirements of permits because it's going to probably cause your staff more headache than anything. Um, here is where we're also seeing exemptions, and I know that causes some uh, concern and you have to be cautious about it, but obviously the intent of regulating vehicle signs tends to be around trying to prevent somebody from using a vehicle as extra signage versus trying to crack down on contractors or delivery cars that are using their vehicles in a day-to-day -day, you know, operations and just naturally have their signage on it. Um, so being careful to craft language that tries to um, provide for those opportunities. But the one thing you can do is pro make prohibitions of this type of signs if, for example, the vehicle's not mobile, that they're just parking out uh, a tractor trailer and taking away the actual um, truck component of that. And the other part is if the vehicle that the sign is on is actually parked or stored illegally, um, or being used illegally, then 
it then enforce the the fact that the vehicle is not um, being parked or stored legally and not worry about the signage, but that is the possibility to, to regulating it in that manner. Next slide. Finally, there's a whole bunch of other types of temporary signs out there, and I talk a little bit about them in the, each of them in the report. Um, we're seeing some communities that regulate window signs, either temporary or permanent, um, and some just regulate them as window signs, so we do talk about them a little bit. Um, portable message centers are still out there. They're probably not, I would say that they're probably not as popular as they once be, uh, were because banners are so easy to just run out to FedEx and get. Um, but they are out there and we, we have seen a number of them, so there are regulations for them. And then also these advertising murals, murals or um, large graphics that we see in some of our large metropolitan communities where you have huge blank building faces and communities are allowing signage on. Well, some of that signage is um, permanent where they've painted murals and the like, but in other cases we're seeing the attachment of temporary type materials to it. And I think that raises some additional questions related to temporary signs that we talk about in that report. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to James and, and see if we have any questions. Yeah, thanks, Wendy. We have uh, a lot of really good questions, and I just wanted to reiterate, you know, if we don't get to your question, feel free to contact any one of us, and we will uh, help you out the best that we can. So. Uh, so here's the first question. What about sign codes that prohibit obscene or lewd messages? Is this conflict with read at all? Uh, well, one of the things we did not talk about in terms of uh, <clears throat> a First Amendment is, is whether um, whether we're dealing with speech that is protected by the First Amendment at all. And uh, obscenity um, is is not protected uh, under the First Amendment. However, uh, you can really get into a lot of trouble uh, in terms of of trying to define uh, what is obscene and uh, or 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 what is lewd. And and so, I think the better approach is is rather than uh, trying prospectively to make a determination uh, that that um, uh, uh, part particular uh, content is is lewd or obscene, and putting that within a sign code, uh, the better way to deal with this is is to leave it as a, uh, uh, a prosecutorial uh, 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 prosecutorial issue. Um, the much better way, I think, to approach this is that this is not for planners. Uh, this is for your district attorney, and uh, and and it does not belong in the sign code. Uh, it belongs uh, elsewhere in your in your municipal code, uh, dealing with things like public nudity, etc. So I would I would just stay away from that and and leave it up to the DA. Okay, thank you. Um, what about uh, different types of categories of commercial signs um, and different, uh, it could be either monument or it could also be a, a different um, type of, you know, like a maybe a directional sign versus uh, real estate. And is that, uh, is it okay to just to regulate both with time, place, and manner? Okay, well, I, you know, James, I'm I'm hearing I'm hearing monument and directional and real estate, so uh, we're 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 sort of mixing uh, mixing up uh, mixing up different things. So a monument sign. Uh, now we're talking about a structure, and that, and that's classic content neutral time, place, or manner. As soon as you start talking about directional or real estate, now you, now you're talking about cat categories of signs based on content, and that is right. Uh, 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 where Thomas was saying that's going to be considered content-based and subject to strict scrutiny. And I would add, you know, I've been working in Ohio and in this area for a long time, and our courts have been pretty strong on the content neutrality part before Reed. Um, so we've tried to, to work in that context. 
long for a while. And when you when it comes to with the old fashioned directional signs, and I think Alan, you showed a picture of them, the enter, the classic enter, or the pointing signs. Um, the way we've seen it being done is is regulating those as driveway signs, small driveway signs that are permitted closer to the intersections of driveways and streets that are traditionally used for that, and then regulating it based on size and, and height and not getting into the content. Yeah, okay, I, I, agree, I, uh, oh. I agree, Wendy. And, it, and, you know, one would hope that after Reed, um, allowing uh, a driveway or direction, you know, driveway or directional, whatever you want to call them, uh, which, which really is, is aimed uh, explicitly at, at safe auto, uh, automobile wayfinding um, right, right at the street. Uh, you would hope that a court would would accept, if challenged, I hope would a court would accept the notion uh, that that there's a compelling uh, interest in in traffic safety, certainly at that location, and and a sign indicating that this is the driveway uh, and this is how you proceed really is the least restrictive means of 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 serving that compelling governmental interest. But we don't know that yet. Okay, thanks. We've got a number of questions that deal with um, commercial versus non-commercial and the, um, the strict scrutiny apply in both cases or not? Well, prior to, prior to read, uh, regulations of commercial, commercial signs typically, um, uh, if, if challenged, uh, the, the standard applied was uh, a form of uh, intermediate intermediate scrutiny that we call uh, the central Hudson test uh, and, and essentially what that said is as long as the sign uh, you know was was uh, about a lawful activity so you couldn't have a commercial sign uh, ad advertising a house of prostitution right if if prostitution is, is prohibited so as long as it was lawful activity uh, you then essentially had a form of intermediate scrutiny you know you had to show a substantial interest um, in in the regulation and that the regulation did not suppress uh, was not intended to suppress speech and it was narrowly tailored to achieve the governmental interest and then sometimes uh, it also added uh, you also had to show that there were ample alternative avenues of communication uh, the, the, the courts are very confused about exactly what form of heightened scrutiny uh, to apply um, Reed did not directly address uh, what happens when you have a regulation that identifies uh, uh, a, a sign for regulatory treatment on its face and that's a commercial sign. Uh, the prior case law says you should be applying intermediate scrutiny. Read, if, if read literally, uh, Thomas's majority opinion now says no, that's a content-based distinction and, and you should apply uh, strict scrutiny. Now, there's, there's a, uh, a general concept about uh, in constitutional law that, that says if you have a decision, uh, for example, Metro Media, uh, which said you can distinguish between commercial and non-commercial, you can distinguish between on-site and off-site, and those are not content-based. If you have a decision like that by the Supreme Court, and then a later decision, such as Reed, uh, uh, announces a rule that seems to contradict the rule that the court had adopted in that previous case, but the new case, Reed, does not explicitly say that the prior case, Metro Media, is overruled, then uh, this rule of interpretation says that prior, the rule in that prior case still stands. In other words, we, we disfavor uh, in, uh, overruling prior court precedent uh, by implication. So that's why things are confused uh, because, because of that we don't overrule by implication rule. We now have prior Supreme Court precedent that says those kinds of on their face distinctions are not content based and Reed says they are. So, you know, it's a good time to be a sign lawyer. <laughs> uh, thank you. 
for that answer. Uh, we've got a number of questions that deal with um, having specific type of temporary signs allowable for only, uh, say, uh, like a nonprofit or for another entity only. I just wanted to have your comments on that. That sounds like a, I mean, that sounds like exactly what Thomas said you cannot do, that that is speaker-based. Uh, you are deciding who gets to speak and who doesn't. Okay, uh, we uh, you know we like it when certain nonprofits speak, but we don't like it when other nonprofits speak. Uh, it's going to be content based. Good luck defending that with with without you know why are you why are you favoring you know we'll just choose so why are you favoring the Boy Scouts uh, over the Girl Scouts right? What's your what's what's your compelling governmental interest for that? Uh, yeah, and this is one I would agree with that. I mean in um, I've run into a couple situations where um, communities have asked, yet can't we give a, you know can't we give this local organization, this local nonprofit, a break, and give them more signage or give them some more opportunity to do something above what would would be allowed for other um, applicants? And I've argued that um, that's uh, that's likely to be illegal. E uh, I'm sorry, likely to be illegal. Um, and is, is if they go down that road is pro is going to be a, a slippery slope. Yeah, I mean the bottom line is what what you're really doing is you're saying well we're going to have one set of rules for most people, but then there's these people over here we really like, and we're and we're going to give them special rules. I mean essentially that's what you're saying, and uh, I don't think you're going to be able to defend it. Okay, thank you. We also have a couple of questions that deal with. There's some states that there's one question from North Carolina. I'm aware of some other states also that have uh, separate uh, distinct requirements for political and in some cases bill billboards. How does uh, read impact these uh, state regulations that um, I'm aware could could be in conflict directly with with read? But what are your thoughts on that? Well, let me, Alan, let me jump in first on this because I saw a number of these type of regulations when I was doing the research, and here's what I advised. Um, <laughs> I advised the communities there, and then I'll let you you talk about the content and that type of thing. Um, there are a lot of community, a lot of states that, and I don't know the example he may be thinking of, but you know there were a lot of states I came across that um, either the state election uh, commission had rules that you know political signs can be put up you know, except 30 days before the election and pull down whatever that was, 10 days after, um, or that political signs could be in the right of way. And my argument always was, if another state board has that requirement, let them deal with it and don't try to mimic their rules that might be that might bring your zoning into question uh, in yours. Let them enforce it. Let them deal with it, and, and zoning should stay out of that. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Wendy on that. Um, the more fundamental issue is that um, under our constitutional system, uh, under the supremacy clause of the uh, uh, U.S. Constitution, uh, uh, it, it, read uh, trumps uh, any state regulations. So. Uh, if if uh, a given state says you can only have a political you know you 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 can do political signs for 30 days, uh, Reed is going to say that's content based on its face, and um, you know if somebody challenges that, uh, the fact that that there's state legislation permitting it, uh, it doesn't. The only thing that means is that the state legislation is unconstitutional under Reed. In which case, I say, let the state take the fall. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, that's why I said I agree with you, Wendy. I, I, no, there's no purpose in replicating that. Right. Well, thank you. Do you have uh, any additional comments? We've got a couple questions on uh, off-premise versus uh, on-premise and making no distinction. And uh, one city had uh, recommendations to do that uh, due to read. What are your additional thoughts on, um, on that? 
I have um, long before Reed came into play. I I did come across just in in communicating and talking to planners at different conferences. I did come across one community that said, you know what, we just got tired of it. You know, we got tired of the battles. We got tired of the enforcement hassle, and they went to completely content neutral. You know, we we're not saying if it's on premise, off premise, commercial, or free speech. Here are strictly the types of signs you're allowed and the length of time. Now, I've not had a chance to look it over, but I am aware that there are communities out there that have felt that that's the best way that they could go to have the least amount of risk from um, this kind of content-based. Um, yeah, and, and and you certain and Wendy, you certainly, I mean, you certainly can do that, and and you certainly can just say, look, the maximum, the maximum uh, size of a sign, you know, on a lot that has no other use. Uh, is is X, and depending on what you choose as the figure for X, you know you can you can effectively uh, limit outdoor advertising. Um, I would just encourage anyone before they did that to step back and really ask themselves, well, you know, is that is that what they want to do? Uh, there are communities where uh, for where outdoor advertising can be very helpful. Uh, in in um, uh, for tourism, for example, uh, or or for local businesses, uh, a number of uh, communities across the, uh, the United States are now uh, allowing uh, digital signage on government-owned land uh, as as a way of uh, making up for revenue shortfalls. Uh, due to cutbacks, uh, so it, it's it's a little it's a little more complex of an issue, and I'm not suggesting you you go one way or the other. What I'm suggesting is uh, not to have a knee jerk reaction of okay, let's you know uh, let's just not have any billboards. Uh, uh, I think you really need to step step back and and look at your the needs in your own particular community and what are the pluses and minuses of all the factors and then make a decision. Uh, thank you. We've had a number of questions on when will the presentation be available and also on uh, Wendy's study. I, we do have that available at that link and if you're having any troubles with that, contact me directly. That uh, the, the link under the science.org and be happy to send that your way. And uh, and when is this uh, presentation going to be posted, uh, Ben? Well, James, we've been recording this, and it will be available on the consortium's YouTube channel. Um, I hope later today. Um, so um, it depends on how long it takes to convert and, and post to YouTube. And we'll also have the the PDF of today's presentation, uh, the PowerPoint presentation, on the uh, Ohio Planning website. So that's uh, www.ohioplanning.org/webcasts. Uh, and that's and for people who are looking for the YouTube channel, that's where you can find the link as well. Uh, I want to give a, a virtual round of applause to our, our panelists. This has been a terrific presentation on a very difficult and complex area of law. Uh, and certainly we look forward to more cases on it, but we hope that uh, our listeners aren't the defendants. Uh, thanks again very much uh, for tuning in today and look forward to uh, participating in future webcasts.